Hi, I'm Pastor Nick Stavropoulos of Rosewood Church of the Nazarene in Toronto, Canada. On behalf of our Rosewood Church family, I want to sincerely thank, I want to thank all those who are working hard in hospitals, clinics, medical centers, seniors' homes, and many other places trying to help people during this COVID-19 crisis. Thank you to each one of you. Thank you also to public transit bus drivers and subway train operators, streetcar operators, grocery store and pharmacy workers, and many others who are working at the risk of exposing themselves even more to COVID-19. We want to express our appreciation to each one of you, and we're so thankful to our government for all that our government people are doing to try to help the people of Toronto and Ontario and Canada. God bless you all. I want to also express appreciation to many, many of our viewers and listeners who wrote us a note in response to last Sunday's message called, Be Encouraged. We heard from people not only here in, in Toronto and Ontario, but we heard from some folks out in Prince Edward Island, uh, down in the Caribbean, and even further south in Brazil. So we appreciate hearing from many of you from near and far away. We are grateful for the kind words that you wrote us. Well, today is Palm Sunday. It is the day when we remember how Jesus, Son of God, rode a donkey into Jerusalem. It was the Sunday before the Friday on which he was crucified. Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem is often called the triumphal entry. It is probably called that because of the large, praise-filled crowd which he attracted. It is worth noting that, that Jesus entered Jerusalem mounted on a donkey, an animal associated not with the rigors of war, but with the pursuits of peace, for Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Amen. My friends, our country is at war with an invisible enemy. In fact, there are over 200 countries who are currently at war with the invisible enemy called coronavirus or COVID-19 virus. I encourage you to, to, to stay with me to the end of the message, and I'll tell you what the Bible says about plagues and pestilences and diseases. Now I want to speak to you today on the theme of how should you and I face our future? In light of all that's happening, how should you and I face our future? We discover some answers to that question from the Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Matthew chapter 21, which tells us what happened on that first Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter. And here's what the Bible says in Matthew 21, beginning at verse 1. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there and its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this? they asked. And the crowds replied, It's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. 
Well, that's an incredible portion of Scripture. And I want to say to you, first of all, today on this theme of how should you and I face the future, first of all, face your future with courage. Let's face your future and mine with courage. And this truth comes to my mind from the fact that Jesus went publicly into Jerusalem at this point in time. By this time, there was a price on his head. The Gospel of John, chapter 11, verse 57 says, The leading priests and Pharisees had publicly ordered that anyone seeing Jesus must report it immediately so they could arrest him. Now, you would have thought that Jesus would have slipped into Jerusalem unseen and hidden away in some secret place in the back streets. But that wasn't so. In fact, Dr. William Barclay, a great Bible scholar, says this. He says, It is a breathtaking thing to think of a man with a price on his head, an outlaw deliberately riding into a city in such a way that every eye was fixed upon him. It is impossible to exaggerate the sheer courage, the sheer courage of Jesus. How? How can you and I face our future with courage? And by the way, here are a couple of definitions of, of courage. Courage is the ability to do something that frightens you. The ability to do something that frightens you. Or strength in the face of pain or grief. So how can you face your future? Well, here are some ideas that I, I believe can help all of us. To begin with, A, for those of you that might be making notes, remember God has given you gifts and abilities. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, why don't you read it with me from the screen? It says, God has given, you, has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. When you remember that the Lord has given you a variety of gifts and abilities, it can help you face your future courageously. All right? Last year, Cody Taeyum Lee, if I'm pronouncing his middle name correctly, Cody, singer, songwriter, and pianist, won America's Got Talent at age 22. Now, what is especially intriguing and incredible about this is that Cody is very autistic, and blind, but as he was growing up, his family helped him to discover his talent. His mother especially, and no doubt others, saw that this precious autistic blind child still had a lot of talent in him. And so they helped him cultivate that gift, that ability. And who would have thought that some years later as a young man, Cody would win America's Got Talent. I heard him sing, by the way, Bridge Over Troubled Water, a fantastic song. And what a blessing it was to hear him sing that song. What I'm saying, my friends, is this. You might not feel, you might not feel like you have all the greatest gifts and abilities in the world. And I don't feel that way either. However, when I say I don't feel, I don't feel I have all the greatest abilities in the world either. However, focus, focus on and make the most of whatever ability God has gifted you with, and it will help you to face your future courageously. Does that make sense to you? I hope it does. Here's another idea that can help you face your future with courage. Point B, 
Seek. Seek to do the Lord's will. Proverbs 3, verse 6 says, why don't you read it with me from the screen? Let's read it together out loud. You read it right where you are, whether you're watching in your, in your living room or kitchen, wherever you might be. Why don't you read it with me? Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Is that good? Read it again. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. That's a New Living Translation, by the way. When you and I are truly seeking to live out the Lord's will, that helps us to face our future with courage. We can be at peace. We can say to ourselves, you know what? I am simply trying to live out God's will for my life. And that helps us to be courageous. One of the reasons Jesus, Son of God, was able to go into Jerusalem courageously was because he knew he was carrying out the will of his heavenly Father. And so I want to invite you to seek to do God's will in your life. Young person, young person, seek to do God's will. Say, Lord, thy will be done in my life. That's what I did when I was a teenager. I said, Lord, I want to seek your will for my life. And so the question is, are you seeking, are you pursuing God's will for you? There's a beautiful hymn that Adelaide Pollard wrote some years ago, and the words are marvelous. They say, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will while I am waiting, yielded and still. There are more verses to that beautiful hymn, but you, you get the idea. Let's say, have thine own way, Lord, in my life. Here's another truth that can strengthen you and, and encourage you as you face your future. Point C. Remember, you have the love and support of your family and friends. Psalm 68, verse 6 says, God places the lonely in families. John 15, verse 13, Jesus says, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. I want to just remind us, cultivate, cultivate your friendships with your immediate family and with potential friends. Those relationships can help you face your future courageously. Amen? Here's something that, uh, that hurts me and makes me cry. And at first I was thinking of leaving this out, but as I'm just sharing with you, I, I think this might help some as I get into this. On various occasions, uh, there are people from our neighborhood where our church is located who phone me or drop by the church during the week asking, asking if we could uh, help, help them pay their rent or mortgage, all kinds of situations. And we as a church try to help in every situation. At the same time, when people come to us for assistance, I will often say, in addition to us helping you or trying to help you, let's think of some ways or let's think of some of your family members and friends who would probably like to help you if, if they only knew that you are in need. And here's what hurts me. When I say, let's think of some of your family members and friends who would also probably like to help you, too often the person says to me something like this. They'll say, oh, I, I don't want to have anything to do with my parents. Or my parents don't want to have anything to do with me. Or 
I don't want to talk to my brother. I, I don't want to talk to my sister. And they don't want to talk to me. Uh, I, I don't have any friends. It's very painful as a pastor when I hear those words. And pretty soon I realize that the person I am dealing with has isolated himself or herself from the very people who would normally want to help them during their difficult time. And this is a little reminder to please, please, cultivate your family and friendship relationships, and that will also help you to face your future courageously so that you feel surrounded by people who love you, who care about you, who are there for you at whatever stage in life you might be. Here's another insight to assist you. Remember that you have the promise of the Lord's presence. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9 says, read it with me. It says, this is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. My friend, you can face your future with courage because the Lord goes with you into your future. Amen? Here's another reason you can face your future with courage. Point E, God is for you. God is for you. He's on your team. Not only is God with you, but God is for you. Read with me Romans in the Bible, chapter 8, verse 31, 32. Read it with me from the screen. If God is for us, who, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? What incredible words from the Holy Bible. Powerful words. Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Let's go to point F. Remember, your future is in God's hands. Psalm 31 verse 15 says, my future is in your hands. Referring to the Lord, of course. My friends, Jesus faced the last week of his earthly life with courage. And I want to invite you to face this week. I want to invite you to face these days with the COVID crisis. I want, you, I want to invite you to face this next week, uh, the next month, and the rest of this year courageously for the reasons I've mentioned and more Let's mention as well point G. What can also help us, of course, is in terms of the COVID-19 virus crisis. Remember, practice staying two meters or six feet away from people. Let's continue to make this a practice. This past week, I had to go to the grocery store to get some groceries. And one thing I was pleased about was to see that, that almost everybody took this matter seriously and, and stayed at least six feet away from others. I was so delighted to see this. I was so delighted to see that the store, the grocery store, had made special provision or encouragement for people to keep their distances. And of course, when we're talking about some of the things we can do to prevent spreading the COVID virus, remember, we need to constantly wash our hands, wash our hands, and uh, our medical authorities have given us other guidance and assistance how we can help prevent the spread of COVID. So let's keep practicing, keep doing what we should be doing. Amen? My friend, whether or not everything is going smoothly in your life, or whether you are wrestling with a health challenge, a family feud, a financial crisis, a work or school challenge. Face it courageously for all the reasons that we have talked about, and there are more reasons as well. Amen. 
Let me share with you a second very important and beautiful truth that comes to my mind when I read of how Jesus went into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Second few, the second truth is this. Face your future with Jesus as king in your life. Face your future with Jesus as, as king in your life. Or we might say face your future with Jesus as the CEO of your life, the chief executive officer, the one that is your boss, the one that is in charge of you, the one that really is your guide. And this truth comes out of verses 4 and 5 in Matthew 21. Verse 4 says, this took place to fulfill the prophecy in terms of Jesus going into Jerusalem. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, look, your king, capital K, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Look, your king is coming to you. Talking about Jesus. Think about this. Even when Jesus was first born, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king? Where is the newborn king of the Jews? They said, we saw his star as it rose and we have come to worship him. That's Matthew 2, verse 2. And when Jesus was standing in front of Pilate, the Roman governor, the governor said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, You have said it. You have said it. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15 declares, For at just the right time, Christ will be revealed from heaven by the blessed and only almighty God, the King, the King of all kings and Lord of all lords. Wow. What does it mean to truly make Jesus King of your life? What does it mean to really make him King of your life, of my life. Here's a part of the answer. Making Jesus king of your life means this. A, making Jesus the first priority in your life. That's what it means, making him king. It means making Jesus the first priority in your life. For many people, their first priority is everything else except Jesus. For many people, their first priority is sports. For some, it's music, movies, dance, money, work, school, friends, travel, relaxation, family, Possessing the newest phone or the newest computer or the newest tablet. And many of these priorities are, are okay or even good. But ultimately, making Jesus king of your life means making Jesus the first priority in your life. Is Jesus number one in your life? Is he number one? Or is he number two, three, five, ten? Or he doesn't even make the top ten list? Making Jesus king of your life further means, point B, it means giving Jesus your very best. The Bible says, when Jesus was born, the wise men were guided by a star to find baby Jesus. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verse 11 says, They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, 
and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. In a sense, the act of wise men giving Jesus gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh was an expression of them giving their very best to the child who was born to be king. And so I want to ask you, are you? Are you giving Jesus your very best in terms of your time, your talents, your tithes and offerings? And let me say, this month of Easter, I want to especially address our Rosewood Church of the Nazarene family here. And this also applies to, um, to all of our Nazarene churches, other, other Nazarene churches, and, and maybe to many other denominational groups as well. But this month of Easter is a time when we want to give our very best to Jesus for world missions, world evangelism. Will you and I give our very best for world missions? We have hundreds of missionaries in the Church of the Nazarene that we love to support as they preach the gospel and do a lot of medical work and do their best for the Lord. And so this month, let's give generously for world missions, shall we? There's a beautiful hymn called Give of your best to the master. The first verse of it says, Give of your best to the master. Isn't that good? Give of the best to the master. Give of the strength of your youth. Throw your soul's fresh, glowing ardor into the battle for truth. Jesus has set the example. Dauntless was he, young and brave. Give him your loyal devotion. Give him the best, the best that you have. Are you giving Jesus the best that you have, the best that you are? I encourage you to do so. Making Jesus king of your life also means surrendering all that you are and that all and all that you have to Jesus the songwriter says it best, perhaps, through the hymn, I Surrender All. The hymn writer says, All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. In his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All. Wow. Another beautiful verse says, All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. On this special Sunday, this wonderful day, I ask you, Will you make Jesus king of your life? Will you decide to do so? Stick with me now. There's some important information I want to share with you that is directly connected to the COVID crisis. I can't tell you. I cannot tell you why this COVID-19 virus has come into our world, our country, our province, our city, our lives. I don't know exactly why it has come to us at this point in history. I'm confident that no one can answer the ultimate question of why we're having this pandemic. The Bible, however, the Bible is not silent on the issue of plagues and pestilences. By the way, I 
quickly looked up a definition uh, for plague, and one definition is a contagious bacterial disease. It's often not just a bacterial, but anyway, that was one definition. The, another definition for pestilence was a fatal epidemic disease. Anyway, the Bible is not silent on this issue of plagues and pestilences. Joel Rosenberg, R-O-S-E-N-B, as in beautiful, E-R-G. Joel Rosenberg was in quarantine for 14 days in Jerusalem because of COVID-19 concerns. While he was quarantined, he decided he would study to see what the Bible has to say about plagues, pestilences, and diseases. He studied hard during those 14 days on this topic. He wrote 12 pages about his research, which, by the way, you can download for free by going to joshuafund.org. joshuafund.org. Now, don't go and do it now. Let me finish this message. His research... His research is entitled, What Does the Bible Teach About Pestilence, Plagues, and Global Pandemics? He discovered the word pandemic is not in the Bible, but the words plagues and pestilences are in the Bible, and they show up, they actually show up about 127 times in the Word of God. Joel Rosenberg says this, he says this, and I'm quoting him. He says, Throughout the Bible, we see repeated examples of God, of God using diseases to accomplish his divine and sovereign purposes. The question is, why would God, why would God allow plagues and pestilences from a biblical perspective? Why? From Rosenberg's research in the Bible, he found and he said there are, there are primarily three reasons. Three reasons. Here they are. Reason number one. Plagues and pestilences are a divine judgment to an individual or a nation or a group of nations for chronic, unrepentant sin. For chronic, or for ongoing, constant, unrepentant sin. Now please stick with me. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that's why we have our current crisis with the COVID-19 virus. And no one can say for sure. Joel Rosenberg is saying, in history, biblical history, chronic unrepentant sin is one of the reasons why God has allowed plagues in the past. And I don't like saying that. I don't like saying that, but that is true according to our Holy Bible. A second reason why in the past God has allowed plagues is this. Reason number two. Reason number two is to warn other individuals and nations that they too could face divine judgment for chronic, that's ongoing, for chronic unrepentant sin. A third reason why in the past God has allowed plagues and pestilences is this. Reason number three. It is to shake up, to shake up an individual, a nation, or many nations so that they will wake up, so that they will wake up from spiritual slumber. That is from a lack of spiritual interest, a lack of interest in God to wake up from rebellion, to repent of their sins, and turn in faith to a holy, personal, biblical, 
healthy relationship with God. That's reason number three. And Rosenberg says repeatedly in the Bible, God explains that in his mercy, he will shake, he will shake individuals and nations in a desire to get our attention and to draw us to him. Amos chapter 9 verse 9 says, for I, will, for I will give the command and will shake Israel along with the other nations. I will give the command and will shake Israel along with the other nations. Haggai, Haggai chapter 2 verse 7 says, I will shake all nations. I will shake. I believe Joel Rosenberg has accurately summarized why God has allowed plagues and pestilences on a large scale in the past. Now, no one can say, no one can say with certainty why God has allowed our present pandemic with COVID-19 virus. Nevertheless, my friends, nevertheless, I believe all of us should be shocked all of us should be shocked by the fact that there have been over, over 50,000 deaths from COVID-19 virus worldwide to date. And I saw even today the figure increased. And this week in the United States, this past week, experts predicted there will be between 100, 100,000 and 240,000 deaths in America alone before this crisis is over. In the community where our Rosewood Church of the Nazarene is, is located here in Toronto, more specifically in, in the suburb, as we used to call it, in, in, in Scarborough, where we're located at a senior's home just a few minutes' drive from our location. This past week, Eight precious people died from the coronavirus. We don't know for sure why God has allowed this pandemic, but all of us need to take it as a wake up call. We must take it, my friends, we must take it as a wake up call. Whether you're an existing Christian, whether you're someone that has just tuned in by accident, maybe it was not by accident today, whether you go to church most Sundays or you've never gone to church before, we need to take what's happening as a wake-up call, as a wake-up call in Canada, United States, in Europe, all over the world. Over the past 50 years the truth is, many people, many people have been drifting away from God. In fact, many times, the wealthier people become, the more they're inclined to drift from God. Not, not everyone, fortunately, but that's often how it turns out. People, people have been more and more drifting away from God in Canada, in the United States, in Europe, all over the world. Prayer has been taken out of the schools a long time ago, as most of you know. Governments have, have taken out any plaques or references to God in government buildings and, and courthouses to keep a few complainers happy. Abortion has been legalized in many countries. Marriage between a man and a woman has been looked upon as, quote, old-fashioned, when in reality it is God's plan for marriage to be between a man and a woman. And the truth also is, even many people, stick with me now, I know some of you are not going to like what I say, but whether you're a part of the Rosewood Church of the Nazarene family, whether you're a part of another congregation somewhere, this applies, this applies to so many people. The truth is, even many people who call themselves Christians have become very careless and lax in your devotion to the Lord. When there isn't a, when there isn't a, a crisis like COVID-19, 
Christians should gather in places of worship every weekend, whatever your church might be, wherever your, your congregation is, whatever your faith might be. Christians should gather in places of worship every weekend at whatever time church services are scheduled. There are some Christians who are very devoted and will not miss a chance to worship, to worship the Lord unless they are sick or out of town. I appreciate different people in our own Rosewood Church family who are at times for the week will say, Pastor, I'm really looking forward to our worship time this Sunday. I'm looking forward to our time of praise and time to, to hear the word of God. And I rejoice and give thanks for those dear people. Sadly, there are many other Christians who skip church. Whether it's Rosewood Church or all kinds of other churches. There are many Christians who, who skip church for so many different reasons. Some because they enroll their children in all kinds of, of sports programs and, and other programs when they should be in Sunday school and church. And your children grow up and, and you wonder why they don't know anything about God or they don't know anything about Jesus. They don't know anything about the Bible. You put them in all kinds of other things when they should have been in the house of God. Simple and true. True. Then there are other Christians who show up to worship God maybe, maybe once a month. Maybe once a month, if that, if it's not raining or it's not snowing, if it's not too hot or it's not too cold, or if you have nothing better to do. And it's kind of like, well, you know, uh, well, when I feel like it, I'm going to give God some time. And we got to wake up. Got to wake up, wake up, wake up and smarten up. And really make things right with God. Then there are some Christians. There are some people who, who always have enough money to buy the latest clothes. The newest cell phones and the latest TVs. But never, never give tithes and offerings to your local church. Let's just be honest. Or if they do give, it maybe amounts to half a percent or one percent of their income. And God says, bring all the tithes to your place of worship. Malachi chapter 3 in our Holy Bible. Malachi 3 verse 8 and following says this. And you can see it on the screen as well. Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. Boy, that, that hurts me when I read that. You know, it hurts when, when, when God says, Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You are under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. And verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Storehouse. That, that, these days, that's, that's, your local, that's your local church where you worship. Whether you're in the Nazarene church, or the Baptist church, Pentecostal church, Anglican, the Catholic church, um, Whatever. Or whatever, Salvation Army, the many different churches, names. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, listen to this. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me, put me to the test. Wow. Are you tithing? Are you giving tithes and offerings? If so, great. And I want to thank the many people at Rosewood Church of the Nazarene who are, who have been, and who are faithful in your giving. But overall, I want to ask, all of us, those of you who are watching 
who are part of the Rosewood Church family, and the many others of you who are watching today, if as yet you have not started to tithe and you're a part of whatever church it is, begin, begin to give your tithes. A tithe is a tenth of your income. That's what it is. My friends, I challenge, I challenge all of us to see this COVID-19 pandemic as a wake-up wake call. As a wake-up call. Please, stop living your life as if God doesn't exist. Surrender all that you are and all that you have to Jesus Christ. And so I ask you, will you make Jesus king of your life? Will you make Jesus king of your life? Will you make him the CEO of who you are? Will you make him the chief executive officer? Make him Lord of your life? Decide to do so. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And if this prayer expresses the desire of your heart, would you pray it with me? Don't, don't just pray it because Pastor Nick that you happen to turn to today, don't pray just because Pastor Nick is asking you. No, no, no. This needs to come from your heart. It's a heart issue and a mind issue. So if this really is what you sense in your own mind and heart, would you pray this prayer? Now, I'm going to keep my eyes open as I lead you. And I want to encourage you to pray right after every sentence. Dear Lord, thank you for loving me. Today, I see this as a wake-up call. What's going on with COVID-19 is a wake-up call for me. And I want to wake up. I want to wake up to the fact that you love me, dear God, and that you have a plan for my life. And God, I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive me. Please forgive me. Adopt me into your family. I believe I can be forgiven because Jesus, your son, died on the cross to pay the price for my sins and rose triumphant over the grave on the third day. I believe and I open up. I open up the door of my heart to your spirit. Lord, you have said in your holy Bible, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. I open that door today to you. Come into my heart. Come into my life. I truly, I truly want to make you king of my life. I make you the CEO, the, the Lord of my life. And I want to live my life devoted to you. And I thank you for the promise of heaven as I live my life with you as my king. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. My friend, if you prayed that prayer very sincerely, I want you to somehow send us a, a note, either through the website or send us a, a letter in the mail to Rosewood Church of the Nazarene, giving us your name and your address, your phone number, your email so that we can help you 
get started in your spiritual journey. We want to help you get into, get into a Bible study. We want to help you get connected to a local church. If you live in Scarborough and Toronto, we certainly invite you to become a part of our Rosewood Church of the Nazarene family located near Markham Road and Highway 401. We're at 657 Milner Avenue, Scarborough. As you know, all churches, including ours, we've all had to close during this COVID-19 crisis. But when, when the doors of churches open, I want to encourage you, if you can join us at Rosewood Church of the Nazarene, join us. Or, or if there's another church closer to you or another church that you feel more comfortable with, whatever name it has, as long as it's a good Bible-believing church, I want to encourage you to attend that church. We have many Nazarene churches across Ontario, across Canada, in fact, across the world. But there are also many other wonderful churches of various denominations. And together we're a team. We're a team wanting to worship God. We're a team wanting to bring men and women and teenagers and children into the family of God through faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so if you, if you will take the time to let us know of the spiritual decision that you've made, we will communicate with you. We want to help you in your spiritual journey. May God bless you. May God bless you. Just before we, we close here, I just want to have a, another prayer, prayer blessing for all of you. Heavenly Father, I just pray for your blessing upon all of our viewers and listeners today. May you please protect them. Protect them from COVID-19 virus. Help them, Lord. Help them as individuals. Help them as families, dear God. And we pray that you'll continue to help our doctors and nurses and medical people who are working hard through the whole health system. And may you continue to guide our, our, our governments as they're doing their best. May you continue to help our Prime Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau, and, and our Premier in the province and our, our local politicians as they do their part Give them wisdom and guidance, dear God, and bless, bless them. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let me say, some, some of you, and I hope even more of you, some of you have been asking how you can give, how you can give to Rosewood Church of the Nazarene during this time when we're not able to gather on Sundays for church services. Here are a few ways by which you can give. Number one, you can send your tithes and offerings by Canada Post. And thank you to those of you who, who have been doing that. The address of our church, 657 Milner Avenue, Scarborough, Ontario. The address is on the many bulletins that hopefully you have at home from being here at previous church services. Or you can also find the address on the church website, rosewoodchurch.ca. How you can give as well, you can give by e-transfer, e-transfer. Using your online banking app or your bank's website, you are able to, to e-transfer your tithes and offerings to the church's bank account. Please send e-offerings or e-transfers to, here it is, to offerings at rosewoodchurch.ca. That's offerings at rosewoodchurch.ca. And in the memo field, please include your, um, your envelope box set number, if you have one, include your name and the designation of your donation, for example, tithes, building fund, missions, whatever. And remember, please, this month, we want to give generously for world, for world missions. We have a goal. We have a goal of giving $60,000 for world missions by the end of April. And here's a third way that you can give. You can drop off. You can drop off your offering in the church mailbox when you're in the area. And of course, please don't leave cash. There's a fourth way you can give. You can give through the Canada Helps website. Canada Helps website. And if you go to our Rosewood Church website, rosewoodchurch.ca, you can get some instructions as to how you can give through Canada Helps, all right? So, once again, 
Thank you so very much for joining us for this service and for this message. We love you. Jesus loves you. And may the Lord, by his spirit and by his power, protect you and shield you and bless you. Amen and amen.